Welcome everybody to the super fast Instagram Q&A. I hope you enjoy your stay. Why is the intro riff from the Beatles' Drive My Car so rhythmically disorienting? Yeah, so let's check out this intro. It's got this nice blues inflected guitar riff. But if we tried to count along to it, we'd run into some difficulties. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. If we count it this way, we run into this hiccup issue where it seems like there's almost an added beat or there's this like record skip effect into the beginning of the verse. Some transcriptions account for this by transcribing the bar before the beginning of the verse as a bar of nine eight, like a measure of four four with an extra eighth note. That is very clearly not how the Beatles were thinking of the tune. And to prove it, here is a Beatle counting off the tune. And you can hear that the downbeat is in a very different place. Did you catch that? The first eighth note of the guitar riff comes one eighth note before the downbeat. It is a pickup. This is why it's kind of rhythmically ambiguous. I have the tendency to hear the first note in a riff as being the downbeat unless I have a strong reason to believe otherwise. So in a way I've been tricked into counting the music like this. When in fact the music should be felt something like this. The same music, the same recording, but it's experienced differently depending on where we feel the downbeat. Anyway, this all comes together with a piece of jargon that I'm gonna throw at you. Post facto metric ambiguity. The music doesn't make sense in your head until after you've heard it and have some kind of context for it. And then you can hear it the right way. Now I say this is the right way of feeling it, but clearly you could feel it any number of different ways. This is just the way that one of the Beatles actually Feels it. Now, starting an introduction with a pickup is a great way of introducing metric ambiguity, a feeling of not knowing exactly what's going on before everything comes crashing down into the beginning of the first section. This is how it for release starts with a little bit of metric ambiguity. It starts with an eighth note pickup. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Just a little bit of a hiccup before we get into the main music, like the Beatles did in the beginning of Drive My Car. So, Case closed, right? That's the reason why it's rhythmically complicated. The downbeat starts in a different place from where you're expecting it to, right? Wrong. See, it's actually more complicated than that. Let's take a look at the split stems. Right here is the third beat of the second measure of the introduction where the guitar plays a quarter note. The drums play a fill which should start on the third beat of the second measure. <laughs> But as we can clearly see in the stems, it starts significantly earlier. In fact, the drums start almost equidistant between the and of two in the guitar part and the third beat in the guitar part. Meaning that even within the metric ambiguity, there's also disagreement between the different musical parts, which creates an even more unmoored effect, which I think is pretty cool when everything comes crashing down at the beginning of the verse, but it does mean that it's even more difficult to understand what's going on until after you figured it out. Understanding where the downbeat is, is a very important part of not only making music, like as musicians, we need to know like when the downbeat is to coordinate with one another, but also listeners of music are deeply affected by a meter because it defines when you move your body. This is called entrainment, where you sync your body's movements to the musician's downbeats and also your fellow listeners' downbeats. So if for whatever reason, you're not hearing the same downbeats, you're entraining to the music differently and that means you're perceiving the music completely differently from somebody else. You're like, you're literally experiencing something different. It'd be like looking at this coffee cup and you seeing green, but I'm seeing orange. Like for an artist, that might be kind of a cool effect to exploit, right? There might be some interesting things to explore with that schism in perception. So it's a cool artistic effect. It discombobulates you in a cool way, I think. 
how can I use Roboto effectively without making it seem like overkill? So most people think that playing Roboto is playing without time. And I don't really like to think of it that way. Instead, I think of time being more elastic. This goes back into the idea of entrainment. You want people to still be feeling time and feeling time together. So we experience music not alone. It's just that the time is being bent and stretched in different ways. So what I'm doing here, when I'm playing rubato, is I'm still feeling a pulse and playing melodies which can be felt in pulses, but just letting the time sit a little bit more in between melodic phrases. That, I think, is the key to rubato, letting time sit in between phrases. What's up with musicians and coffee addiction? Drinking a cup as I type this. Cause coffee fuels the fire. Mm. Delicious. A minor seven, F sharp minor seven, F major seven, E minor seven. Great sounding progression. Let's check it out. Three of these chords are from the key of A minor. We got A minor, of course, and then also F major seven and E minor seven. The one chord that isn't from the key is F sharp minor seven, which is borrowed from the parallel major. It comes from A major. This progression works so well in loops because all four of those chords have an E in them. And you can keep that E going on on top in this loop as kind of a pedal point. We call that a soprano pedal point. It's a note which keeps us grounded from chord to chord. It doesn't ever change. Whenever you have the same note repeating over and over again, it gives the feeling of being grounded as different elements around that note change, like in this chord progression. It's a solid and tasty chord progression, if I do say so myself. How do you come up with a good counter melody? So a counter melody is just a melody which is designed to go alongside a main melody and in some way contrast it and support it. So let's take the melody from that last little groove there and come up with a little of things that we could do to contrast it. For one, it's a descending melody that starts off of the beat, and it primarily is in eighth notes. So maybe to create a counter melody, we find the rhythmic spaces in between the melodic notes of the first melody and do ascending quarter notes. contrast is a big thing. That works because it's a contrasting timbre, it's a contrasting melodic arc, and it's a contrasting rhythm that occurs in the negative space of the first melody. That is the key, I think, to writing a good counter melody. How would you resolve G sharp minor 11 flat 13? Ugh, that's a spicy meatball. I'm not sure what that accent is. I'm sure it's problematic. Please don't cancel me. So the reason why this is so intense is because of the relationship of this note, the D sharp, to this note the E natural. It is a minor ninth, it is a prime dissonance, and it is the source of all of our stress. If you ever find yourself with a chord that has that flat nine interval, like this G sharp minor 11 flat 13, try swapping the notes that form the minor ninth into different octaves. So this D sharp goes up here, and this E natural goes down here, giving you this sounding chord, which instantly, like, sounds so much more beautiful and ethereal and more resolved, which is wild because it contains the exact same notes as this chord. And yet, here we are. Any tips for call and response that generally work well? What cues to listen and respond to? So call and response, otherwise known as question and answer or antecedent and consequent, if you're being all fancy, is the practice of improvising something that's similar to what another improviser improvise. It's actually very similar to the idea of counter melody. You're trying to find something contrasting so that the musical logic links the two ideas. So if somebody goes up, you might want to go down. If somebody plays one long note, you might want to play a lot of fast notes, presumably in time and not mashing the keyboard like I just did. But at the core of it, in a call and response exercise, there's a conscious contrast between the musical ideas. And that contrast is the thing that ironically makes them sound related. Now this approach is 
great. It works fantastically in many styles of music, many styles of jazz, but it can get you in trouble if you're playing in Miles Davis's second quintet, if you're Herbie Hancock, for example, in this clip. <laughs> Herbie Hancock played something complementary to Miles Davis's melody, but in this particular band, Miles Davis was attempting something new. In many ways, the second quintet was trying to separate itself from established jazz tropes, including call and response. Hence, Miles Davis's hilarious reaction. God bless you, Miles Davis. God bless you. What's the most common problem you see new improvisers have, and what advice do you have for them to solve it? One thing that happens when I'm teaching new improvisers, like in a private lesson setting, is that they'll be improvising over some chord progression that we're working on, just letting their fingers fly to their heart's content. And I'll ask them to stop and play exactly what it is that they just played. And more often than not, they'll get the certain look in their face, realizing that they have no idea what it was that they just played on their instrument. The problem is often that musicians are not playing with intention. They're not pre-hearing the melodies before they play them. Their technical ability to play scales and chords and maybe licks has superseded their ability to hear music in a meaningful way before they actually play it. My big advice is to always slow down and play less so that you can hear more. That way you get into the habit of really listening to your playing. If you expect the audience to do the same, start doing it for yourself. I heard Jocko's first album recently, and it's incredible. Why don't we hear that kind of tone more often? Jacob Astorius is a giant among bass players. He really revolutionized the instrument, and part of the reason why he's so famous is because of his incredible, incredible, incredible tone. He played a fretless jazz bass that he defretted himself, and the tone has such a particular singing quality to it that is just so good. The problem, unfortunately, is that his tone was so unmistakable that nobody could play with a tone that even resembled Jocko's tone without being accused of basically copying him. It's a tone that's so unique to Jocko that it's difficult to create your own voice trying to mimic Jocko's voice. And so many people have moved very intentionally away from that kind of fretless tone, even if they end up playing fretless bass. Kind of weird how that works. It was so good and so influential that nobody seemed to really do anything with it after the fact. Any thoughts on the whole white people don't swing as much as black people thing? Okay, so I don't like the statement that white people can't swing and black people do swing, but the most charitable defense of it is that jazz is a black American art form and that culturally it takes a lot from black culture. That's its origin. And so if you are black and you grow up in black culture, you are more likely to be familiar with the particular musical and cultural tropes of jazz music than white musicians who are relatively new to the whole thing. That's that's the most charitable defense of that I could possibly give. Any other defense is, of course, very stupid. Plenty of white people can swing. Plenty of white people have great rhythm. And there's this element of it which I really also don't like, which it kind of implies that music like jazz and rock and funk and music of the like black African diaspora, like the main value in those styles of music is rhythm. And of course, rhythm is an important intrinsic part of those styles, but there's so much more to them than just rhythm. Melody, harmony, timbre, lyrics, all of the great wonderful things that make jazz, rock, hip hop, blues, all those styles of music so great and so awesome and so affecting those things are just replaced with rhythm. Black people have rhythm. And yeah, I mean, it's, I, I don't like that. I think there's a lot more to it than that. What's today's sponsor, Adam? So this video was brought to you by Curiosity Stream and my streaming service, Nebula, which is the creator-owned streaming service that is not beholden to YouTube and is in turn not beholden to the major music labels, Universal, Warner Chapel, and Sony. These three bad boys have given me so much grief over the course of my YouTube channel as a music educator because they inevitably come after my monetization and will also sometimes block my videos, which is a pain in the ass. This video, because I mentioned Beatles music, will especially be a target. That's not a huge problem because I and many other music educators here on YouTube have started to migrate their catalog over to Nebula, like 
Charles Cornell, for example, Mary Spender, Amy Nolte, Twelve Tone, Sounds Good, and many other creators in different educational niches. Nebula is a fantastic place to watch and discover quality content ad-free and support the creators that you love. For people who want to support creators like us, there's some fantastic behind-the-scenes content over on Nebula, like Philosophy Tube's latest hour-long documentary all about how Abby puts together Philosophy Tube videos. It's great. As a longtime fan of Philosophy Tube, quality content. I must say. Now Nebula, as well as this video, is supported by another fantastic streaming service that you should check out, Curiosity Stream, the go-to source on the internet for the very best documentaries with thousands of titles to choose from. These high quality cinematic documentaries include ones like Genius Within the Inner Life of Glenn Gould, a fantastic look at the idiosyncratic pianist. Certainly Gould is one of the most important artists of the 20th century by any objective measure. One of the most important pianists of all time, certainly. If you're interested in Curiosity Stream, you can go to the link in the description or curiositystream.com slash Adam Neely to get started today for 26% off or $14.76 per year and also get a subscription to Nebula absolutely free. By clicking the link in the description and signing up for this Curiosity Stream Nebula bundle, you're not only supporting this channel, but the entire community over at Nebula as we create content that tries to engage the world in a more meaningful way. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching.